Hello there. How are you? Patty43, you were first on today. I think I've seen you before. Thank you for joining me. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. My name is Gilbert, and we have been reading fireside readings during the coronavirus lockdown. We've read many wonderful books all the way through, unabridged readings, every day, just a little bit, and we've read, I think, six books together, and we're on our seventh. Um, I'm thoroughly enjoying doing it, and I thank you all for joining me. Uh, if you miss any chapters, you can go to the YouTube channel on Fireside Reading is the name of the channel, and everything gets uploaded there. And please uh, take take a, a listen, a watch, a read to whatever you miss. We are currently reading the book by John Buchan, The 39 Steps. Uh, I remember this as one of the sort of first action-adventure kind of books that I ever read. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed reading it when I was young, and I'm enjoying going through it again now. Bits of it I don't remember, bits of it I do. Um, we're on chapter two, and yeah, I think that's enough for now. What happened in chapter one? Uh, we met Richard Hannay, who has returned from South Africa, and he's rather bored in London, hoping that things are going to happen that are slightly more exciting. And then, guess what? Something very exciting. Uh, an American man shows up at his door, has been watching him, lives nearby, and tells him this tale about intrigue, about a cabal of men and who are trying to bring down other countries and specifically are going to try to bring down the ruler of Greece. Tells them this story. And then a couple of days later, Hane returns to his apartment where the American is living, hiding really, and the American is dead. That's what we just got to. So, welcome to a fireside reading of The 39 Steps by John Buchan. Chapter 2. The Milkman Sets Out on His Travels. I sat down in an armchair and felt very sick. That lasted for maybe five minutes and was succeeded by a fit of the horrors. The poor, staring, white face on the floor was more than I could bear, and I managed to get a tablecloth and cover it. Then I staggered to a cupboard, found the brandy, and swallowed several mouthfuls. I had seen men die violently before, indeed I had killed a few myself in the Matabili War, but this cold-blooded indoor business was different. Still, I managed to pull myself together. I looked at my watch and saw that it was half past ten. An idea seized me, and I went over the flat with a small tooth comb. There was nobody there, nor any trace of anybody. But I shuttered and bolted all the windows, and put the chain on the door. By this time, my wits were coming back to me, and I could think again. It took me about an hour to figure the thing out, and I did not hurry, for unless the murderer came back, I had till about six o'clock in the morning for my cogitations. I was in the soup. That was pretty clear. Any shadow of a doubt I might have had about the truth of Scudder's tale was gone now. The proof of it was lying under the tablecloth. The men who knew that he knew what he knew had found him and had taken the best way to make certain of his silence. Yes, but he had been in my rooms for four days and his enemies must have reckoned that he had confided in me. So I would be the next to go. 
It might be that very night, or next day, or the day after, but my number was up all right. Then suddenly I thought of another possibility. Supposing I went out now and called in the police, or went to bed and let Paddock find the body and called them in the morning, what kind of a story was I to tell about Scudder? I had lied to Paddock about him, and the whole thing looked desperately fishy. If I made a clean breast of it and told the police everything he had told me, they would simply laugh at me. The odds were a thousand to one that I would be charged with the murder, and the circumstantial evidence was strong enough to hang me. Few people knew me in England. I had no real pal who could come forward and swear to my character. Perhaps that was what those secret enemies were playing for. They were clever enough for anything, and an English prison was as good a way of getting rid of me till after June the 15th as a knife in my chest. Besides, if I told the whole story and by any miracle was believed, I would be playing their game. Carolides would stay at home, which was what they wanted. Somehow or other, the sight of Scudder's dead face had made me a passionate believer in his scheme. He was gone, but he had taken me into his confidence, and I was pretty well bound to carry on his work. You may think this ridiculous for a man in danger of his life, but that was the way I looked at it. I am an ordinary sort of fellow, not braver than other people, but I hate to see a good man downed, and that long knife would not be the end of Scudder if I could play the game in his place. It took me an hour or so to think this out, and by that time I had come to a decision. I must vanish somehow and keep vanished till the end of the second week in June. Then I must somehow find a way to get in touch with the government people and tell them what Scudder had told me. I wish to heaven he had told me more, and that I had listened more carefully to the little he had told me. I knew nothing but the barest facts. There was a big risk that even if I weathered the other dangers, I would not be believed in the end. I must take my chance of that and hope that something might happen which would confirm my tale in the eyes of the government. My first job was to keep going for the next three weeks. It was now the 24th day of May, and that meant 20 days of hiding before I could venture to approach the powers that be. I reckoned that two sets of people would be looking for me, Scudder's enemies to put me out of existence, and the police, who would want me for Scudder's murder. It was going to be a giddy hunt, and it was queer how the prospect comforted me. I had been slack so long that almost any chance of activity was welcome. When I had to sit alone with that corpse and wait on fortune, I was no better than a crushed worm, but if my next safety was to hang on my own wits, I was prepared to be cheerful about it. My next thought was whether Scudder had any papers about him to give me a better clue to the business. I drew back the tablecloth and searched his pockets, for I had no longer any shrinking from the body. The face was wonderfully calm for a man who had been struck down in a moment. There was nothing in the breast pocket and only a few loose coins and a cigar holder in the waistcoat. The trousers held a little penknife and some silver, and the side pocket of his jacket contained an old crocodile-skin cigar case. There was no sign of the little black book in which I had seen him making notes. That had no doubt been taken by his murderer. But as I looked up from my task, I saw that some drawers had been pulled out in the writing table. Scudder would never have left them in that state, for he was the tidiest of mortals. Someone must have been searching for something. 
perhaps for the pocketbook. I went round the flat and found that everything had been ransacked. The inside of books, drawers, cupboards, boxes, even the pockets of the clothes in my wardrobe and the sideboard in the dining room. There was no trace of the book. Most likely the enemy had found it, but they had not found it on Scudder's body. Then I got out an atlas and looked at a big map of the British Isles. My notion was to get off to some wild district where my Veldcraft would be of some use to me, for I would be like a trapped rat in a city. I considered that Scotland would be best, for my people were Scotch and I could pass anywhere as an ordinary Scotsman. I had half an idea at first to be a German tourist, for my father had had German partners and I had been brought up to speak the tongue pretty fluently not to mention having put in three years prospecting for copper in German Damaraland. But I calculated that it would be less conspicuous to be a Scot and less in a line with what the police might know of my past. I fixed on Galloway as the best place to go. It was the nearest wild part of Scotland, so far as I could figure it out and from the look of the map was not over thick with population. A search in Bradshaw informed me that a train left St Pancras at 7.10, which would land me at any Galloway station in the late afternoon. That was well enough, but a more important matter was how I was to make my way to St Pancras, for I was pretty certain that Scudder's friends would be watching outside. This puzzled me for a bit, and then I had an inspiration on which I went to bed and slept for two troubled hours. I got up at four and opened my bedroom shutters. The faint light of a fine summer morning was flooding the skies and the sparrows had begun to chatter. I had a great revulsion of feeling and felt a God-forgotten fool my inclination was to let things slide and trust to the British police taking a reasonable view of my case. But as I reviewed the situation, I could find no arguments to bring against my decision of the previous night. So with a wry mouth, I resolved to go on with my plan. I was not feeling in any particular funk, only disinclined to go looking for trouble, if you understand me. I hunted out a well-used tweed suit, a pair of strong nailed boots, and a flannel shirt with a collar. Into my pockets I stuffed a spare shirt, a cloth cap, some handkerchiefs, and a toothbrush. I had drawn a good sum in gold from the bank two days before in case Scudder should want money, and I took fifty pounds of it in sovereigns in a belt which I had brought back from Rhodesia. That was about all I wanted. Then. I had a bath and cut my moustache, which was long and drooping, into a short, stubbly fringe. Now came the next step. Paddock used to arrive punctually at 7.30 and let himself in with a latch key, but about 20 minutes to 7, as I knew from bitter experience, the milkman turned up with a great clatter of cans and deposited my share outside my door. I had seen that milkman sometimes when I had gone out for an early ride. He was a young man about my own height with an ill-nourished moustache, and he wore a white overall. On him, I staked all my chances. I went into the darkened smoking room where the rays of morning light were beginning to creep through the shutters. There I breakfasted off a whiskey and soda and some biscuits from the cupboard. By this time, it was getting on for six o'clock. I put a pipe in my pocket and filled my pouch from the tobacco jar on the table by the fireplace. As I poked into the tobacco, my fingers touched something hard, and I drew out Scudder's little black pocketbook. That seemed to me a good omen. I lifted the cloth from the body and was amazed at the peace and dignity of the dead face. Goodbye, old chap, 
I said. I'm going to do my best for you. Wish me well, wherever you are. Then I hung about in the hall, waiting for the milkman. That was the worst part of the business, for I was fairly choking to get out of doors. 6.30 passed, then 6.40, but still he did not come. The fool had chosen this day of all days to be late. At one minute after the quarter to seven, I heard the rattle of the cans outside. I opened the front door and there was my man singling out my cans from a bunch he carried and whistling through his teeth. He jumped a bit at the sight of me. Come in here a moment, I said. I want a word with you. And I led him into the dining room. I reckon you're a bit of a sportsman, I said, and I want you to do me a service. Lend me your cap and overalls for ten minutes and... Here's a sovereign for you. His eyes opened at the sight of the gold and he grinned broadly. What's the game? He asked. A bet, I said. I haven't time to explain, but to win it, I've got to be a milkman for the next ten minutes. All you've got to do is to stay here till I come back. You'll be a bit late, but nobody will complain and you'll have that quid for yourself. Right, oh. He said cheerily, I ain't a man to spoil a bit of sport. Here's the rig, governor. I stuck on his flat blue hat and his white overall, picked up the cans, banged my door, and went whistling downstairs. The porter at the foot told me to shut my jaw, which sounded as if my makeup was adequate. At first, I thought there was nobody in the street. Then I caught sight of a policeman a hundred yards down and a loafer shuffling past on the other side. Some impulse made me raise my eyes to the house opposite and there at a first floor window was a face. As the loafer passed, he looked up and I fancied a signal was exchanged. I crossed the street whistling gaily and imitating the jaunty swing of the milkman. Then I took the first side street and went up a left-hand turning which led past a bit of vacant ground. There was no one in the little street, so I dropped the milk cans inside the hoarding and sent the cap and overall after them. I had only just put on my cloth cap when a postman came round the corner. I gave him good morning, and he answered me unsuspiciously. At the moment, the clock of a neighbouring church struck the hour of seven. There was not a second to spare. As soon as I got to Euston Road, I took to my heels and ran. The clock at Euston Station showed five minutes past the hour. At St Pancras, I had no time to take a ticket, let alone that I had not settled upon my destination. A porter told me the platform, and as I entered it, I saw the train already in motion. Two station officials blocked the way, but I dodged them and clambered into the last carriage. Three minutes later, as we were roaring through the northern tunnels, an irate guard interviewed me. He wrote out for me a ticket to Newton Stewart, a name which had suddenly come back to my memory, and he conducted me from the first-class compartment where I had ensconced myself to a third-class smoker, occupied by a sailor and a stout woman with a child. He went off grumbling, and as I mopped my brow, I observed to my companions in my broadest Scots that it was a sore job catching trains. I had entered upon my part already. The impotence of that guard! said the lady bitterly. He needed a scotch tongue to put him in his place. He was complaining that this ween having a, no ticket and her no forward till August 12th month and he was objecting to this gentleman spitting. The sailor morosely agreed and I started my new life in an atmosphere of protest against authority. I reminded myself that a week ago... I had been finding the world 
dull. Thank you for joining me. I hope this helps a little, and I look forward to seeing you at the same time and place on Instagram, at Fireside Reading, 5 p.m. Pacific time. All chapters uploaded to the YouTube Fireside Reading channel. Until I see you next, please be very well. Good night.